Well, good evening. Glad you chose to be with us tonight. And if you would, go ahead and take your Bible out and turn back to the book of what? Nehemiah, just you only got to suffer through two more messages after today. There's just two more messages in the book of Nehemiah. But we're going to start and read the last verse of chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse 10. And somebody will say to me, Brother Steve, why have you read so many words that are contained in the book of Nehemiah? 13 chapters here, and we've read a whole bunch of the text. And the reason I read the text is I am more confident in what God says than what I am what I say. Okay? So when the Word of God is read, it is living and active and it is very sharp and it changes who we are. So when we read through that Word, there's a difference in you reading the Word at your home and reading it in your mind and when you read it out loud and you hear it and you're looking at it with your own eyes at the same time and it causes you to see things that you wouldn't normally see. As we read through that tonight, I want you to be on trial and I want you to be your own judge. I want you to be the judge to examine yourself to see if you're like the people who had a genuine faith in the day of, ne in the day of Nehemiah. Now what happened is after they had had the, 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 the feast of the trumpets and they listened to the preaching for a third of the day and they broke up into small groups for a week and they looked at the goodness of God and they looked at the greatness of God and they confessed their sins before God and they saw the grace of God it changed who they were. And they had a faith in God that they didn't have before, but it caused them to readjust and reevaluate the way that they lived their lives from day to day. And you're going to see in the text tonight that they chose to make the Sabbath day holy. And not only to make the Sabbath day holy, that they chose, uh, they, they chose to give of their finances and give of their things because there was a tremendous transformation in who they were. And that's the exact same thing that happens with an individual when they come to know Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. Now this morning we saw how that word, when they confess, moved their heart. But tonight we're going to see how that faith caused them to have a new commitment for Christ. In fact, the very first words we're going to see is how they entered into a contract with Christ. And they actually took their very own names, wrote out a piece of paper, and they signed their names to the contract. They were so serious about keeping what they had. And then you're going to see how they submit totally to whatever God tells them to do, whatever's contained in the Old Testament law. And they're going to see that they've got to separate from the world. They can't live like the world lives because they're no longer part of the world, but they're God's people, which makes them holy and a little bit different. So they have to live different even in a world this uh, different from what they're doing. And then you're going to see how they choose to support the things that God is doing in, in and around them. So let's pick up tonight and let's look at Nehemiah chapter 9, the very last verse. Just go right on down to verse 38 right there. And then because of this, and what because of this is, it's everything we heard in chapter 9 this morning. We preached through. Because of this, we make a full covenant in, what's that next word? Writing. Okay, they said it's not good enough that we just tell God we're going to do this. we got to write it down on a piece of paper. And after we write it down on a piece of paper, all the people who, everybody who is somebody or ahead of a family, they're going to come together and they're going to sign that document. Because of this, we make a firm commitment in writing on the sealed document. Now, that sealed document be the same thing today as us getting it notarized. Y'all ever had anything notarized? you got to go down there, you sign it in front of them, and they put the little stamp and the seal of approval. So they got a wax seal on this. They're going to seal it and the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And in verse 1, it says, On the seals are the names of Nehemiah the governor. And it goes all the way down for about 27 verses of the people's names who appeared on there. And we'll pick up in verse 28 where it says, The rest of the people, the priest, the Levites, the gatekeepers, people, the gatekeepers, and the singers, and the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the people of the land to the law of God. Their wives, their sons, their daughters. And all who have knowledge and understanding join with their brothers, their neighbors, nobles. And enter into a, what's that next word? Curse and an oath. To walk in God's law. Now when it says they entered into a curse, what they're saying is, if we don't keep the contract that we just made with God, 
God, you can curse us and you can cause all these terrible things to happen to us. So into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses to the servants of God to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our God and His rules and His statutes. We will not give our daughters to the people of the land to take their daughters for ours. Now the reason they didn't want to give their daughters to somebody else who was not of the Jewish faith because they worshipped one of those little G gods and that was going to cause all kinds of problems in the family. It goes on verse 31, And if the people of the land bring in goods or grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year in exaction of every debt. Because all this is contained in the law of Moses in the Bible. We also take our own ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of the shekel for the service of the house of our God. And for the showbread and for the regular grain offering and the regular burnt offering and the Sabbath and the new moons and the appointed feast and the, and the holy things and the sin offering to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of God. And we the priests, the Levites, the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering and to bring it into the house of God according to our Father's house at the appointed time year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit, every tree, year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of God to the priest who ministers in the house of God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle. And it is written, as it is written in the law, in the firstborn of our herds and our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, uh, the first fruit of every tree, of the wine and of the oil, to the priest, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithe from our ground. For it is the Levites who con uh, collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priest and the sons of Aaron shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive their tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithe. They're going to tithe on the tithe. To the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contributions of grain and wine and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priest who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of God and all God's people say it okay have you ever noticed how sometimes people will get saved they'll come to the church they'll give their heart and their life to Jesus Christ and we'll baptize them next week and then you never see them again in the church that, that happens doesn't it I mean it happens from time to time and you have to ask your question does that person really know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and I want to tell you if they can stay away from the church and never come back to the church I promise you that they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior but if they're drawn back to the body if there is a transformation in their life so that faith is making a difference in how they live their lives, then that's evidence of their salvation. First thing we see tonight is the confession. The people make a confession. They, make, they, they write out that list and they sit down and write that. It said in verse 38, because of all of this, we make a firm commitment in writing on a sealed document in the name of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And it gives you 27 verses of all of those guys who signed that document. But you know, we find that in the New Testament as well. A person's walk with God must always be begin with a profession of faith, a declaration of faith. You know, in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, it says, So everyone who acknowledges me before man, and this is Jesus speaking, I also will acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before man, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Or we could actually read it in Luke chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, where he says virtually the same thing. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men, I will deny before the angels of God. So we have to start with a profession of faith. Being able to take a stand and say, no matter what, I believe that you are Lord and it's going to make a change in our lives. In fact, when we got saved, we did what's contained in, in Romans, 8 and 9, uh, Romans uh, 10, verses 8, 9, and 10, where it says, if you confess with your mouth, what? 
Jesus is Lord. So when you say that Jesus is Lord, you're giving Him full control of your life and you're making a profession and acknowledging that He now rules your life. You see, the starting point for the people of God is a relationship with God. And it is a commitment that they're going to make their lives align with what is taught in the Word of God. We are not saved because we keep the Word of God. We are saved because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But if you have a genuine faith, over time, your life is going to begin to line up with what is in the Word of God. The Spirit is going to call you to the Word. You're going to go to the Word and read. And when you read the Word of God, it's going to cause you to see that you've got to make adjustments in your life. You're going to make those adjustments over time. And day by day, you'll become more and more like Christ from day to day. Second thing that we begin to see in the text tonight is that the people of God submitted to the will of God. Would y'all say that line with me? The people of God submitted to the will of God. That is a surefire evidence that the Holy Spirit is inside somebody because there won't to changes. You know, the old preacher would say, uh, when you come to Jesus, you can sin all you want to. Because after you come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you won't sin all you want to. You will sin more than you want to. Because your wonder will have changed and it breaks your heart whenever you do sin. And you want to be who you're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. Nehemiah 9.25 said, Join, join with their brothers, the nobles, and, and they, uh, the nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk God's law. And, and that was given by Moses, the servant of God, to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our, of the, the Lord, our Lord and His rules and His statutes. They were saying that we know that we've been given some regulations from God that we have to keep. Now, praise God, we don't have to keep the Old Testament law. I'm so glad that I get to eat oysters and I get to eat shrimp and I get to eat all these things that were excluded on there. And we're no longer under that Old Testament law because that Old Testament law was fulfilled by one man. And who was the man who fulfilled the law? His name is Jesus Christ. But now we are under two new commands that we have to keep which is why all the other commands existed anyway to start with, especially the Ten Commandments, we have to do what? We have to love God with all of our heart, and then we have to love people, love others as we love ourselves. We're commanded to do that. And whenever we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, daily we develop a deeper and deeper abiding love with God, but we also begin to develop a deeper and deeper loving relationship with the people that we come in contact with. When a person is coming to God for salvation, there is to be an understanding that a changed life will follow. You may have heard the words repentance. You ever heard that? Repent and be saved. What this is, is the leaving from the wide road and entering into the narrow road. Remember what Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. I know you remember this. It's almost as if you can see it right in front of your eyes. And it would say, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to what? Destruction. And those who enter by it are how many? Many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are how many? few. So who are the few? You and I, those who come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, because we're, we're getting off the road of independence, and we're walking the road of holiness that God has called us to walk in our lives. So we want to be who He wants us to be. The people of God in Jerusalem knew that they must return as a nation to the laws that were given by Moses, given, by Moses, given to Moses by God. We as believers know that the Bible lays out the ways of God and we're to spend the remainder of our lives seeking out the way of God and walking in that way as we live from day to day. That's the reason a believer reads his Bible every day. If you're not reading your Bible every day, you're not going to know the path God's calling you to walk for that particular day. Let me tell you how amazing God is. So many times when you read a particular set of scriptures early one morning, you're going to get into the middle of your day somewhere and you're going to see how that scripture comes alive in the middle of your particular day. What if you didn't read your scripture that day and you get into the middle of a situation and you don't know what God wants you to do all because you didn't read the word of God that morning that was preparing you for the situation that you were getting into? 
you got to learn to walk the path that God has set before you as all of us walk the path. Now, I'm going to say a negative statement right here, and this is not a good thing, but it's the truth. The absence, now listen to me close, the absence of submission to God's Word is a confirmation that one is not living a changed life, and consequently, the evidence points to an unreal or an ungenuine faith. When there is no change, it's evidence that there's no walk with Christ. A faith, what that is, is not a faith in God. That's a faith in self-rule. But we don't, we're not ruled by self. We're ruled by Almighty God. And we see how the people of God were transformed as they made this commitment. They were going to follow God and do the best they could to be who God wanted them to be. Third thing I think we can pull from the text tonight is this. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit will lead to a separation from worldly ways. Now Jesus said that we are the light of the world. And he said that we must be in the world, but that we're not to be of the world. That we must come away from them and be separate. Now that means we're going to go into the world and walk right side by side with people. But we're going to walk in holiness even though they're not walking in holiness. So that we can be the light that shines on them. So they can come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there's got to be a, a radical change in who we are. When a person is truly born again, they're purified by the presence of the Holy Spirit that lives in them. They're not purified because they decide one day that they're not going to ever sin again. They're purified because the Holy Spirit has now come upon them and gives them the ability to now say no to sin and to choose to do the right things which they couldn't do before the Holy Spirit was in them. Uh, uh, that causes them to realize that they can't live like everybody else and causes their behavior to change. Now you're not saved because your behavior changed, but when you are saved, what happens? Your behavior changes because it changes who you are. The people of God separated themselves from the people of other faiths. All right? Nehemiah 10.30, it says, We will not give our daughters to the people of the land or take their daughters to be our sons. You know, in 1 Corinthians, it says, Do not be unequally yoked in the King James Version. In the newer translations, it's a little easier to understand. What God is saying there is a person who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and a person that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and their Savior have no business getting married to each other. And almost every time that I've seen two people come together where one of them was saved and one of them was unsaved, the two would fall apart. And here's the reason for that. Because the decision-making process used to make all the decisions in life is either a decision to satisfy self or it's the decision to satisfy God. The believer will decide to satisfy God. The unbeliever will decide to satisfy who? Themselves. And it will wind up tearing them apart in their relationship. It's important that every, every young person in here comes to find another believer to be united with them in holy matrimony when the time comes. The people of God separated themselves and it was evidence even to the point of their Sabbaths. Because remember, that at this point, they're still under the law. They're not living out. Jesus has not fulfilled the law at this point, so they're living under the law. So they're having to keep to remember the Sabbath day and do what? Keep it holy. So on the Sabbath day, they're not supposed to do any, any work whatsoever. And it said in Nehemiah 10.31, After the peoples of the land bring in goods and uh, any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, you will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day, and we will forgo the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. In other words, on the seventh year, they had to forget about the debt and wipe it out. They were going to follow those laws that were Old Testament laws there because they knew that they they we're supposed to. Now you and I, we're going we're gonna to keep those two laws that we're supposed to keep. We're going to love God with all of our heart. We're, we're going to try not to break his heart by letting sin come into our lives. But we're also going to love the people that we come in contact with and we're going to do what's best for them in their lives. First thing, I, fourth thing I think that the text is going to show us tonight is this. The people of God became financial supporters of the sacrificial system and of the uh, Levitical priesthood. It said in verse 35, We obligated ourselves to bring the first fruit of our goods and the first fruit of all our fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. 
Now, I want to stop right here and say that it was Billy Graham who said that he felt like probably 60% of the people in our churches today who were at church every Sunday were actually lost and don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, which left about 40% of the people who actually believe, who actually had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you that I don't think that's true in Ridgely Heights Baptist Church. I think the number is more like 80% of the people at Ridgely know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that. Because of the way that you give your finances and your first fruits and the things that you give to this church. You bless this church. When God blesses you, you bring your tithes into the storehouse. And it is evident that you bring your tithes into the storehouse because every year, year after year, there's more money coming in and being given at the church at Ridgeland, which is evidence that when you have blessed God by being faithful with what you have, God has blessed you with even more. And as He blesses you with more, so every year you're bringing more in than you brought from the year before. Because when a person comes to know Christ as Lord and Savior and their life is radically changed, it causes them to become a joyful giver and somebody who wants to give. In fact, the name that comes to mind whenever I think about how God radically changes people is the name Zacchaeus. Now, who was Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And what did he do? Climbed up in the sycamore tree. Why did he climb up in the tree? All right, y'all must know the same song I do. But what did he do? He took all that he had and he started to give back and he made right all the bad relationships that, they, that he had and he, and he paid everybody back off and then he gave what he had to the poor to feed them because of the radical change that took place inside who he is. And that's how I know that so many people in, in Ridgely Heights actually do know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm going to tell you, and I'll just be honest with you, if you're not a tither and you're going to Ridgely, you're one of the few. You're in a minority around here. And you're, you're, you're robbing yourself of a blessing. But the, really and truly, I, what I want you to check is not to see if you're tithed. And I want you to check yourself to see if you really know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because God moves in your heart and He changes who you are. The people of God give of their first fruits and they support that which God is doing. So what do we do with all the things that we've learned tonight? The application for this. And here's the application right here. Number one... Submission to the Lordship of Christ is the cornerstone of one's walk with Christ. It amazes me the number of people that think that they can get uh, uh, profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be baptized and come to the church and then ask God what God wants them to do in their lives and then they'll decide whether they want to obey God or not. If you have to decide whether you're going to obey God or not when He gives you instruction, you need to check your salvation. Because at salvation, you confess that Jesus was Lord. And if he's Lord, that means he's the king. That means he's the master. And he gets to do what? Tell us what to do. And we may be his children. He treats us like sons and daughters and he adopts us into the family. But when we approach him according to scripture, we approach him just like the prodigal son did. You remember how the prodigal son approached him? Whenever he went off and he squandered everything that he had, he decided he would go back to his father's house. Did he go back to his father's house as a son? No, he went back to his father's house saying maybe he'll make me one of, my, one of his slaves because even his slaves eat better than I do. So we approach God as slaves, as his servants, giving our hearts and our lives to him. Second application is this. Holiness is to, believe, is to be the believer's response to salvation. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, But he who has called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conducts, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holiness. Now remember this, your holiness will not save you, but you start to become holy. Why? Because you have been saved, and the Holy Spirit is transforming who you are. I love the way that Isaiah says it in chapter 35, verse 8, where he says, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called, what? Y'all help me with that. Way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Look at that. Believers walk on the way. 
Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Even if we ain't got sense, because we follow God, He's going to lead us in the paths that we need to go down. And it's a wonderful thing. The point is, whoever, uh, or, uh, that, that when God calls us to salvation, He calls us to walk the path that He has placed before us. And in the third and final application for the text tonight is this. Financial support of God's kingdom is not a burden to a believer. It's a joy for the believer. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7, Paul wrote this out. And, and by the way, there's a new movie out called The Apostle Paul. I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to see it. I can't hardly wait to go see it. Paul's the one that wrote these words right down. He said, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God, thank you so much for what you teach us in the Word of God. And you're calling us each.